morning, everybody. This webinar is going to build on the sort of the, the knowledge and the sort of awareness and um, raising of computational thinking and unplugged computing science gained at the first two webinars in this series. But please don't worry if you didn't make it along to any of them because you know you didn't have to come to them first before you come along to this one and they're actually they're both recorded as well so if you do want to catch up on them they're on our DigiLearn Scott blog and we've got all the links for these all the slides and all the presenter notes are there so please don't worry too much about trying to keep up with the slides and take notes at the same time because it's all there for you if you've not already received the email through the Eventbrite email that you signed up with with the links to the the meeting, the slides and the evaluation, we'll share it all again at the end, so don't worry at all. Um, so in the, the last two sessions, the, the, well, the very first one, we looked at, you know, why um, is digital so important? Why do we start at the early level? Um, you know, where does computing science fit in? What are the key documents, um, you know, there to support us? And then at the second session, we learned a bit more about the unplugged um, elements of computing science, you know, the very sort of concrete starting points um, and how that can be transferred into the outdoor environment as well. So just to very briefly recap, um, just a couple of slides coming up, just to sort of set the scene again and get us thinking about computing science at the early level. Um, just a quick reminder that we have three organisers in the computing science curriculum that run through broad general education. Computing science is the golden thread that runs through our curriculum and our lives. It's intertwined in everything we do. And if you were at the first couple of sessions, certainly you would be able to, to really recognise that. Computational thinking allows us to take a problem, understand what that problem is, and help us to develop possible solutions. Computational thinking strategies help us to find the best solution to solve a problem correctly and in the fastest way using the least amount of resources, time and space. It equips us with the skills to ask ourselves questions such as, is this the best way to solve the problem? Is it the most efficient way? Is it the quickest way? Will it give us the right answer? Can we use what we've learned to solve other problems? And these are techniques that we use in our everyday life. Understanding and analysing computing technology is all about how computing science works in the world round about us. So if you think, you know, back to that first session, where are computers, you know, what what in our environment has computers inside it that makes things work? Designing, building and testing computing solutions. So this is about programming or coding, using devices or that all important part, all or equivalent to create simple sets of instructions or algorithms. And we'll just touch back on that in a wee second. Okay, so this experience and outcome here, this one here is really important. And we looked at that in both our sessions. So what we looked at first was how we identify and use a range of computing technology in the world around us. I'll just skip that one there a wee bit. And that could be through, you know, really simple resources, everyday resources that we're using, you know, in our daily practice, whether it be, you know, pictorial, simple Play-Doh recipe books. Um, we have our visual timetables. We have our storyboards, you know, all, all the resources that we use on a sort of daily basis that we would maybe link quite naturally to literacy in English or numeracy in maths. And we discovered how that links really nicely into computing science and computational thinking as well. But just want to highlight again this ENO here, programmable devices or equivalent. And that means that you don't need to have a single device to hand at all to be able to provide these experiences and opportunities. We also introduced the computational thinkers resources from Barefoot. 
pain. If you've not had a wee look yet, please visit the Barefoot site. It's a wonderful free online computer and science bank of resources, loads of activity ideas and everything's all mapped to the curriculum. It's really got resources that you can just pick up and use um, you know, in your playrooms, in your classrooms straight away. Um, and the reason that we've highlighted this poster is because it's a really good reminder here of the concepts and approaches that we use and the language that we use when we are providing these opportunities and these learning experiences with our young learners. And what's important to remember again is that this language is transferable. So, you know, if we're talking about, you know, can we can we debug the algorithm or, you know, can we debug the code that we can use that kind of language, you know, if something else isn't working, you know, somewhere else, and um, perhaps you you know maybe it's a tower or a bridge that's been built in the brick corner and you know it's not stable it you know it, it won't um, balance or stand up properly okay can let's tinker with it let's find out maybe what could be wrong is it you know the same height at both sides at sides you know is there a bug in it you know is it a brick that doesn't quite fit um examples such as that Okay, now also in the last session, we introduced this option of having key roles in computing science activities. So for example, when children are working together, they can take turns to be either the programmer, the developer or engineer, or the bot, so they can become the device, become the robot themselves. And this is a really nice concept from CS Unplugged. Again, everything here is linked. Um, and what it does, it just really creates a really nice sense of teamwork, respect for each other and encourages cooperative play. Um, so that's another handy resource, just really worth checking out. And then it means that, you know, everybody's got a special part to play. Everybody's got an equally important job and everybody's valued. So that was just really a really quick sort of five, six minutes um, recap of what we covered in the first two sessions. But again, please don't worry um, if that all sounded you know, completely unfamiliar to you because it is explained in more depth over the first two webinar recordings. Louise, do we have any questions or is it anything um, that you think we should maybe mention before we go on to the, the super fun part, what we're all here for? Um, no questions at the moment, so everyone's sharing where they're from. So we've got people coming in from Angus, quite a few people coming from Angus, so that's lovely. That's where I'm uh, coming in from as well at the moment. We've got uh, Anne from Murray and we've got, who else do we have? We've got folk coming in from South Lanarkshire as well. So it's nice to share where you're coming from. That's all happening in the chat. I've also popped in a wee question because I know a lot of people don't like to, to put their microphone on. But please do pop in the chat. I've asked, you know, um, has anyone been exploring computing science with the learners? And if so, just tell us a little bit about it in the chat. We'd absolutely love to hear from you in there. But again, at the end, if you're feeling like you want to put your, your mic on, please do chat to us uh, and let us know. So over to you, Eva. And um, if there's any great questions, then I'll, I'll we could pause and I could uh, I could ask you. Great. Thanks, Louise. Super. Okay, so in this session, we're taking everything that we learned from the first two a wee step further and moving what we've learned from unplugged activities into the physical resources and the online computing science um, resources, taking the concepts and the skills with us. Now, we're not able to cover absolutely every resource that's been created, but what we have done is we've selected sort of the most common devices and resources that we know are out in schools and nurseries um, at the moment. So again, it's not all of them we possibly couldn't do that. I don't even know um, all of them that exist. I know that I discovered a couple um, of new resources yesterday that I had never even seen before and um, that are, you know, really great for early level. Um, computing science so there's um there's yeah there's there's absolutely hundreds out there um, but we've picked out the sort of most common um that you might already be familiar with so first up here we've got codepillar so i don't know if anybody has saw codepillar before and what i'm going to do is i've got a little video um of the devices in action because what we would do if this was a face-to-face -face session you know i would have i would have had my wee suitcase my wee trolley full of all these devices and they would have been all out for you to tinker with yourself and you know have a have a wee explore with but instead today i'm going to show you a little video of them rather than try and describe what they look like um, or how they work go watch the video
so with the code pillar, you can see there that the parts on its back, they all come apart and each part has a direction symbol on it. It has an arrow on it representing what direction it will go in. So that's what makes up your algorithm or your code here. So if you think back to how we were learning um, about coding in the beginning, we were using, you know, it might have been paper, it might have been arrow cards, it might have been um, using a whiteboard, and you'll see the whiteboard was in the, the start of the footage there, because, you know, it's really important that we can plan out um, our route first and test it first, because then if anything goes wrong, you know, we'll, we'll maybe then be able to identify that point and we'll know where to change. So, Code Pillar um, is from Fisher Price various different um, blocks there for the directions and you'll see at the end it also had a wee um, a, a, a music part to the algorithm as well so they can all be pulled apart they're nice and chunky um, you know the good size for small toddler hands they can be pulled apart and then clipped together in the order of your choice now they have a start in and an ending block as well um, and that sort of helps you to you know to to, to plan your route so that you have a start point then and an end point. I'm just going to move on to some resources that we have here around Coda Pillar. So on this slide here, I'd like to give a very special thank you to a Dundee practitioner, um, Judy Regan. Judy has kindly shared her resources with us. She's done a lot of work and a lot of development with Coda Pillar um, in early learning and childcare. And if anybody was lucky enough to get along to the Scottish Learning Festival in 2019, you might have actually saw Judy speaking. She had a seminar there about all her work. Um, and what we've done is we've popped all the resources that she has into an open folder on OneDrive so that you can get in um, and download them in there. Okay, so there's a set of arrow cards here. And what they done um, in this setting was they had them printed out in um, large size, they were laminated, they had string on them, and the children could wear them, you know, round their bodies to help them to sort of physically execute that code first themselves and to also create the algorithm so that they knew, you know, what way the code of pillar was going to move in. Um, the children would decide on the directions the code of pillar was going to travel in. They would then get into that line themselves. They would hold on to the person in front of them. The head part would listen for each child in turn to call out the direction and then move in that way. So they became a human code of pillar and they all travelled together. Um, and this again could be extended by planning in advance, you know, how to reach a particular object. Maybe they're going to go on a journey and um, they're going to follow a certain route uh, and recreating the actual code of pillar and moving alongside it as it moves, you know, or maybe making a plan for moving in a shape. So let's see if we can make our human caterpillar move in the shape of an S or, you know, a circle or a square or whatever they the, um, chosen sort of output was. Um, so I've popped some of these little images on the screen, but you can download all of these, you know, in full size. And I think there's also, we've popped in there, um, some of Judy's resources from Scottish Learning Festival as well. So big thanks to Judy Regan for sharing these with us. Okay, so this one might be a wee bit more familiar to you. This is probably the, the first ever um, programmable device that I got my hands on when I was back in nursery. So these have been going around for quite a while now, the BeeBot, um, and you can access them, resource them, or source them, sorry, from TTS, one of the many places. So let's see, what does BeeBot do? Let's have a look. So he doesn't have parts that attaches to him like the Coda Pillar, but instead he has buttons um, on his back. So you input the algorithm or the code by pressing the buttons in the order of your choice and then you press the go button. 
what you might notice with this video is there's a pen taped onto the back of this bee bot and that's just to help make the root a little bit more visible. You would have noticed with the, the code pillar that as it executed each part of the code or the algorithm, that chunky part, that body part flashed so you knew which part of the code it was going through. But once the code goes into bee bot, it becomes a much more abstract concept because then you don't you can't see it you know as it goes through each step and if it takes a wrong turn it can be really difficult to understand you know what went wrong so there's a few different things you can do i'll just move on to the next slide there oops to make that learning more visible so again you might be wanting to use your um you're printed out your arrow cards to lay them out in the order or you might want to use if you can manage if you've got the fine motor control you might want to use the whiteboard um, to draw out your code or your algorithm um, using the pens there or you can simply tape a, a pen to the back as well just like we had in the the video example there just to make that route a wee bit more visible so again, we have various resources and in the notes part on the slides, we have links to where you can access all of these resources. So we have the um, downloadable, the printable um, arrow cards that you can access, um, various different sources, you know, that you can get them for free online. So we've popped those links into the into the chat as well. And there's also on a national technology SharePoint, um, but you do need a glow login to access. We have some story map resources as well. So these can be printed out and they come out in the actual size. I think is it, I can't remember, I always forget, is it? They move in either 12 centimetres or 15 centimetres um, at a time. And when you pop these all together, you know, that gives you, so like pressing go forward once, would move one square, go forward again, would move another square. So it's a wee bit easier than the code pillar, you know, to plan a route for this because you know exactly, um, you know, how many times to press forward based on the squares that you're using. Um, and code pillar is not always as accurate as that. You know, it's, it sometimes goes a wee bit further or a wee bit shorter each time. And of course, because code pillar can move in all those different directions instead of just forward, back, left and right, it can be a wee bit trickier um, to manipulate. Now, you also have with Coda Pillar, or um, sorry, with the B bot or the Blue bot, which I'm just going to introduce in a wee second, uh, an external Bluetooth device called the Tactile Card Reader. So this is particularly useful for wee ones that maybe have additional learning needs, don't have the, the fine motor control to press the buttons, and maybe certainly don't have the, you know, the gross motor control to be able to get down on the floor um, to manipulate a B bot. So instead, these can be paired up with something called the blue bot. So it's essentially a bee bot again, but it has a perspex shell and it has Bluetooth capability. So let's have a wee look at this one in action. So this is the tactile card reader here. It's got little indented slots for placing the cards in. You can either use it vertically or you can use it horizontally. See that I've popped the cards in. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six cards. I've got three cards going forward and then three cards going backwards. So we've connected it via Bluetooth. We've popped the cards in and then we have pressed the button on the card reader. I really really like about this it makes it that wee bit more visible again did you notice the red lights flashing as it was ex executing that particular piece of the algorithm or the code so that if it did go wonky and it took a wee wrong turn somewhere you would know exactly um, what part it was that went wrong so you know that's without having to um, stick a, tape, a pen with tape onto the back of it um, that just helps to make it that wee bit more visible as well. So that's called the tactile card reader and it only works with the blue bot, so the Bluetooth version of B-Bot. 
So just bear that in mind. Have we got any questions coming through so far? No, but we have some international colleagues from the Philippines and Malaysia joining us, Eva. So you have an international audience. Super, thanks Louise. Okay, now another programmable device that you may have already saw in the schools around about you is the Sphero. Spheros can be used from the early level right up through the school and there's various types um, and you require a mobile device to be able to run um, the device because they need an app to be able to um, manipulate them. So there's new spheros just now that we're not going to cover in here, but we're just going to talk about the sort of two main most common that we're seeing in schools just now. So we've got the Sphero Spark and the Sphero Mini. Now the Sphero Spark is waterproof, the Sphero Mini is not. But you can do slightly different things with the Sphero Mini. So you would kind of need to weigh up what would sort of work best for your younger learners. Also bear in mind the Sphero Mini is really small. You can see it in my hand there. It might disappear under furniture and it might be quite hard to find it again. So just have a wee think about what would, you know, if you, if you are going down the route um, or if you're going to borrow some of these from from the school and bring them into nursery um, or bring them you know further um, down the school into P1 just have a think about the sort of the playroom and you know what would work best for you because you might want to spend less time hunting for it and actually using it and that's speaking from experience as well okay so the Sphero Mini can be controlled in a few different ways through the Sphero Play app and I've taken a little screenshot of it here and popped it on um, to the slide it's really good for younger learners or again learners with additional needs because you can control it in a variety of different ways and screen drive is one of the sort of most fun exciting ways that I've ever used um, to control a mobile device with younger learners it, it literally is make a noise scream the louder the noise the faster the sphero goes um, you can also manipulate it by tilting the, the mobile device. So again, maybe if you've not got that fine motor control for um, you know, the, the, the other options like dragging and dropping, you can simply just tilt the, the device to, be, to make the Sphero move. Now, this one here, the Sphero Spark, this is the waterproof Sphero. And I've saw some really excellent examples of this. And I've got a little video um, to show you of it being um, run through paint. So being using the app, um, driven through paint, puddles, you know, the sand tray outside in the garden, going through the, the puddles and the mud, the grass, you know, then doing that all important problem solving, you know, it didn't move as well on this ground or, you know, it moved faster on that ground. Why might that be? Um, and we've saw further up the school again, some fantastic STEM challenges going on where um, learners have been exploring speed, distance and time um, with the Sphero too. So. This example here is using the Sphero Edu app. And on the app, um, we have drawn um, a circle. And it looks like a perfect circle on the app. But of course, if we were to zoom in, would it be perfect? We don't know, but the Sphero can tell us. So let's have a look. Okay, so you could see there at the end, the circle, we'll just skip that back a little bit there, the circle didn't quite join up perfectly as we would have hoped it would. You can see there that it then crossed over. So this is, again, really good fun um, for, you know, just exploring fine motor control or just having a bit of fun with some Sphero art um, in the paint with our early level learners as well. Okay. I'm going to come in here. I've also seen this done really nicely when we were talking about classical music and how it makes us feel. So, mm -hmm. you know, the kids will, will obviously do the, their own painting, but actually using the Sphero and using the device as well is just a, another really, really nice addition to speak about our feelings when we're listening to, to particular kinds of music. It was very nice. That sounds fun, Louise. And on the left here, we've got a really nice example of some Sphero storytelling. So we have a map from Katie Morag out in the, 
the young the learners were using this to retell the story you know where did katie morad go first and they're using the sphero and you could do that again with any of the resources that we've covered already you know it could be you could be having a circle time and instead of you know however it is that you move on to the next person whether it's you know clockwise or whether it's at random you could use the code pillar um, to choose who the next person is that's you know that's going to have a turn or the b bot so just think back to all those sort of examples all the different contexts that we um spoke about the unplugged computing science again and when we were physically moving our bodies to to um, execute the code or the algorithm we can do the exact same here with the devices it's just about transferring that knowledge over onto using it into the devices and how we can you know manipulate and program the, the devices to move and just another couple of examples here um a little bit less common than our b-bots and spheros but we know that these devices are out in the schools um, and some early years settings as well so we thought we'll just very quickly um, touch on these just so that you know you know what they are um, and sort of what they do so um, we've got on the left here we've got marty the robot this is marty version 2 um, and he he's made from a scottish company called robotical and this is Marty in action. Oops. So what was happening here is Marty's not being controlled by an app. He's not being controlled by any buttons. Instead, what this device is doing is it's sourcing its code or its algorithm from the colored cards that are on the ground. And on one of its feet, it has a card reader, a color sensor. And it knows, for example, that the red card or the color red is telling it to stop and dance, that the color purple is telling it to step to the left, that the color green is telling it to step forward. It can also be paired up with a device and used via an app for further up the school but currently it's, it's not available just yet it's been developed just now but in the future marty is going to be compatible with scratch junior so a sort of very early block based um online coding resource and we're going to cover that in a wee second so that one was marty and then you might have saw this pair as well. This is um, Dash and this is Dot, and they're from Wonder Workshop. So again, they both have um, apps that they need to control them. They don't have buttons on them um, or body parts that you clip on to control them. Um, these rely on apps from Wonder Workshop. The apps are all free, and I've popped the links in again to the slides so that you can have a wee look to see um, what the apps uh, there's there's quite a variety with dash and dot and on this example we've got here um, this is using the dash and dot app called xylo where a xylophone can clip onto dash and your code is creating a tune so you're coding the xylophone to tell dash what tune to play That's just one example of how Dash can be used. Dash and Dot also work together. They interact with each other as well. Um, but have a wee look at the links. If, if you have these resources um, to hand at all, have a wee look at the links to see what other apps are available. Personally, I would feel that these are more for sort of the end of early level or further up the school. 
and I would be looking for, you know, if, if, I, if I had my hands on programmable devices and still worked in early level, I would be looking for Codepillar and Dash and Dot, uh, sorry, Codepillar and Bebo. Those are the ones that I feel for early level that you can get most out of, um, although there are other resources available, as we've said, and all schools differ, so it really depends on what you have um, access to within your school or setting. So just before we move on to the online resources now, I'd like to show you a couple of examples um, of how the devices can be used together um, right across the curriculum. So special thanks first to Dedridge Primary School um, in West Lothian who have shared this with us. Um, their um, nativity theme over Christmas incorporated computing science as well and computational thinking. And this is just one example um, of where that came in. The angel Gabriel goes to tell Mary that she's going to have the Son of God and she has to call him Jesus. Mary is very happy to have this gift from God. Thank you, God. I will take very good care of him. Mary goes to tell Joseph that she is going to have a baby and he is the Son of God. Joseph says he will marry Mary and he will love the baby. Mary and Joseph get married and just before she has the baby, they have to go to Bethlehem to the census. They travel very far on a donkey. When they get to Bethlehem, they have to find somewhere to sleep, but the first inn is full. The last inn they find gives them a stable to sleep in. Mary has the baby here. Some shepherds watching their flocks saw a new bright star in the sky. They knew this was the sign of something special so they followed it and found the baby Jesus asleep in the hay. Okay, now does anybody did anybody recognise what is underneath the nativity characters? got B bots here retelling the story. So this just really sums up what we've been saying in all our sessions about computing science, not sitting in isolation, you know, it's not something separate. This is just a really great example of how it's embedded through everything else that's going on as well. Everything that you're doing, all the learning experiences, there's opportunities for computing science in them all. Thanks very much to Dedridge Primary. Okay, and we've got another example here. Now, this is a road safety example here. Um, and when we have a wee look at this video, we'll see how it's linking to health and wellbeing. We're talking about knowing and demonstrating how to travel safely. We're looking at maths um, and movement and games and using simple technology. I can use simple directions and describe positions. And technologies. We're developing a sequence of instructions and running them through programmable devices or equivalent. And this is just an example of a nice activity that can be used with all the resources together, depending again what you have access to, but also a really nice transition activity as well. So bringing your older learners um, from further up the school down to work with your long, younger learners um, to create you know, a, a, a bigger algorithm where they have more than one device all going at the same time. <laughs> You could see there Dash and Dot working together. So the, the B bots were our traffic on the road. Dot was the traffic light. And Dash was waiting for Dot to give it the go ahead. So when Dot flashed green, Dash then recognised that it was safe to cross. But I mean, there, there was a lengthy wee bit of code that had to go behind that. And it wasn't the sort of pictorial code. It was, you know, 
um, algorithm creation for a wee bit further up the school. So that's where it would bring in our, our older learners. But certainly the bee bots traveling um, on the car mat um, are something that you could completely do with um, your early level learners. And I don't know if anybody spotted, there was definitely um, a missed opportunity in this video at the end for debugging. Right at the, the end here, Dash completely forgot road safety and forgot all that prior learning and just flew straight across this part of the road here. So indeed, um, if we were, you know, watching this video back or, you know, re recapping this particular piece of learning with younger learners, we would hope that they would recognise that, oops, oops, Daisy, Dash, you didn't look before you crossed the road here. There could have been cars coming. Okay, so have we got any questions now, Louise, just before we move on to our um, apps and online resources? Um, we've more so got observations from people just saying, you know, that's awesome use of the bee bots, thinking outside the box. These are brilliant. And I think mostly everyone will be like me squealing with utter delight to see Mary and Joseph as bee bots. It's, it's just a lovely use of, um, you know, the technology. And um, I remember once I, I did something kind of similar, but it was at a fashion show and the kids all had to dress up their own bee bots and then, you know, take them down the fashion show and everyone was involved in it and it was just a really lovely experience but what an absolutely marvellous use of dressing up your bee bots for the nativity sorry squealing in the background Eva it's just gorgeous so some of the devices that we've looked at also have apps now I don't mean apps that um, to control them I just mean apps that you can use to replicate um, creating that algorithm if you didn't have access to the device itself. So we've got a BeeBot app here and a Codepillar app. I've linked um, where you can find these apps in the notes. They're both available on iOS and Android. And they're also just, they're really great to have um, because you, you probably won't have, you know, a lot of these devices. If, if I mean, if you're lucky, you'll, you'll maybe have one or two, um, if any. Um, and of course, that can, you know, cause cause a wee bit of difficulty when everybody's desperate to get a shot, and you know, everybody's really keen and eager, especially when they're first new. But if you have the app um, as well, that certainly offers an alternative, and the, the same learning can be achieved through the app as well. So this is an example of the BeeBot app. Okay, so again, you're using the, the buttons or the, the sort of um, the, the visual buttons online um, on the app to plan out your route. You pop them in on your order, then you press go and the, the, the B-Bot then carries out the algorithm. Um, you'll see maybe there at the end, it went forward once too far and it bumped into the wall. So that would be our point there um, to have a discussion, have a wee chat about, oh, you know, did, did anything go, go wrong? You know, what happened there? What, what, what did we do? What could we do to change it? Let's have a tinker with it. Let's look for the bugs um, and let's see if we can um, solve that problem and, you know, put our algorithm in again without it bumping into the wall the next time. And then we have the Codepillar app. Let's have a look at this one. Level two. Right. Use the right turn command to make me turn right. Can you build me a path? Drag the commands into place. Then tap me to go. <laughs> Forward! Let's go! Get out the way! Woohoo! I need your help to get to the target. Now, did anybody notice there, after the, the right turn, we dragged over the forward arrow and initially it was facing, you know, forward, 
and then it quickly turned around on its side. And that can be a really difficult concept to grasp unless you have done that all and put an unplugged um, activity beforehand so that you know, you know, once you turn around, you know, you're still going forward. So I'm just I'm going to show you that again. Um, so if you just keep an eye here and you'll see what happens. Level two. Right. Use the right turn command to make me turn right. Can you build me a path? Drag the commands into place. Then tap me to go. Forward. Let's go. We found the way. Woohoo! Okay, and that, that can be a wee bit confusing for some learners because they'll say, but forwards that way, and you know, now it's turned on its side. So what you need to do there is you need to physically execute that algorithm yourself. And when I watched that, I actually found myself tilting to the right, you know, and physically in my head thinking I've just, you know, turned around 90 degrees to the right. And now I need to go forward again. Um, so that's just, just a wee pointer there that it can cause a bit of confusion. Um, but if you know you've done that all and put in the unplugged activities beforehand, then you can kind of you can understand it because you've had that sort of concrete experience firsthand. Okay. Now in your setting, you might not have um, access to devices. You might not even have access to mobile devices at all. And it might be a laptop or a desktop PC that you have um, in your playroom or classroom. Oh, sorry, that was for the night. I'll come back to that one in a wee second. Um, yeah, so you might want to use an online resource through a web browser. And there's various different options out there again, but one that's particularly great for um, early level is code.org because they have a whole set of resources for pre-readers. Um, and I'm going to show you a couple of examples um, of these just now. So I'm going to click on this first link here. And this is one of the sort of very earliest stages um, of creating algorithms. Um, what this one is, is a simple drag and drop to create this image here. Now, if at any point you're not sure what to do, we go to the, the speaker. Arrange the blocks to form the image. So it gives us the audio. So for our pre-readers, you know, that they aren't able to, to um, understand the text they can click on the, the um, speaker button. It also works with Immersive Reader. So if you're used to using Ma Immersive Reader, the Microsoft Learning Tool, you can click on that and it will give you the text. The Arrange link. the blocks to form the image. And you can access you know, all your Immersive Reader options there, You know whether it be translate, um, whether it be highlighting the syllables, um, if you, you know you want to change the font, you want to change the colour um, of the background and so on. So just, just to um, raise awareness that that is there as well as an option. So arrange the blocks to form the image. Should let me just, there we go, drag and drop. Okay, so just a really simple one, just getting used to the, um, the mouse control um, and the ability to be able to manipulate the, the pieces over for um, later on when we are um, creating simple codes. There we are. And then the second activity, um, or, or an example of another activity, so we've skipped a few out here, we're not going up um, in succession, we're going to skip on just so you can have a wee look at how it progresses. So this time... Play with these blocks and try to get me to the bad pig. Okay, so it's using Angry Birds, so probably quite a familiar um, concept. So we have to move over to the bad pig. So let's see, I'm going to move to the right. Move to the right again, and then I'm guessing maybe once more to the right. I might be wrong. Let's let's find out. 
Okay, and then we're looking for the run button. Oh, I've moved the bird. I've moved the wrong one. No, that was a terrible example. <laughs> Well, it was it was good to show you how it doesn't work. So, okay, it's the bird I'm moving. Moved the wrong one. Trust me, Louise. You have to, you know, <laughs> you have to make these mistakes to be able to tinker back and problem solve, and, and it all goes back to all of that barefoot computational thinking that you were talking about there. It's known my right from my left. <laughs> There we are. So then you can replay it as well. Now, at, at this point, you might want to, depending on the sort of stage that your learners are at, you've also got the option to add in um, the loops. So instead of, you know, the three um, left arrows, we could have the, um, the loop block in. And if you think back to when we were doing our unplugged examples and we had the number cards, you know, instead of having, I think it was, this was the the, the PE exercise, the, the warm up activity that we were doing back then, where we had maybe, you know, like three jumps on the spot, you know, two hops. And we discussed instead of having, you know, all those cards, you could maybe just have one action card, but in front of it, you could have a number card or it might be a dot pattern card if it's subitizing, you know, that you're focusing on, or, you know, it might be the, the cards that have print print outs of the um, the fingers, the hands with the, the, the amount of fingers up to represent that number. You know, so if, if you're using sort of um, seal um, numeracy and math strategies and you, you, you're um, learning about throwing numbers, that might be the visual that you use to represent it um, instead. Oops. <laughs> So loads of options there for progression um, and I'll just take you back um, to the beginning of this just to show you what it looks like. So Pre-Reader Express 2020, completely free to access this. I've not even signed in, although I do have an account and it takes you through the sort of progression from learning to drag and drop, sequencing with Scratch, programming with Angry Birds um, and it takes you all the way through. So even for your own professional learning, you know, even if this isn't something you're, you're ready to introduce or um, use with the learners yet, just for your own professional development, going through through these activities really helps you to understand how it all um, works and fits together. Now, I skipped that one the last time. So um, Scratch Junior um, is an app-based um, programme that's available on iOS and on Android as well. Um, so this is where we're introducing um, creating the algorithms through simple block coding. And we mentioned earlier on that Marty the robot, he has um, been developed to work along with Scratch Junior as well. So I'm just going to, this one's a little video just to show you um, how this one works. Okay, so along the bottom here, you've got various different blocks, okay, pictorial blocks, and you drag them down um, to the bottom to create your code or your algorithm. And then whatever it is you want to happen, it happens up here um, on the screen. So you can choose a background, you can create your own, or you can choose the backgrounds that are already available. And then you choose a character as well. So let's see, what does the cat do in this lovely little street? Okay, so the cat, the algorithm, um, so back to the beginning there, asked the cat to move forward nine times. And then um, forward once more, and then 12 times it 
round in a circle. So we loop round and round in a circle. And then the last block that was added in was a speech block. And this is where you have the option to type into it as well. So maybe again, a wee bit, a wee bit more advanced that part for sort of upper end of early level and further up into the school, but certainly being able to rearrange and order blocks to manipulate the character to be able to make it move um, left, right, forward, backwards, up and down, round in circles, however. Um, and there's absolutely loads of resources out there on code.org as well. So part of the pre reader express resource that's there uses Scratch Junior as well. So the example I showed you was using the sort of Angry Birds layout um, and background, but it also um, has activities on Scratch Junior too. Okay. So has anybody recognised the order that we have sort of introduced these computing science learning opportunities in? Can you see links to anywhere else across the curriculum? Is it similar to how we deliver any other areas of the curriculum? So let's think about our mathematical concepts. So how do we, you know, how do we get to the stage of mental maths? further up the school. You know, we need to start with our concrete objects in the beginning, don't we? Whether it be compare bears or pine cones, where we're learning about, you know, one-to-one -one counting. Then we're moving on to, you know, subitizing and understanding dot patterns before we can do sort of those sums and equations in our head. In computing science, that's what we're doing as well. We're using our bodies to learn about computational thinking and algorithms, creating algorithms at the very earliest stages. So those sessions that we had um, prior to this, where we covered all of that, um, and then we are, when we're moving on, we're using the apps, aren't we, and the resources online to look at the pictorial um, concepts, so creating our algorithms and moving, you know, whatever our characters are going to be in pictures. And we need to get that first. We need to understand that before we're at the abstract stage further on, where we are using the sort of more, um, it's still block coding here in this example, but it's much more tricky because, you know, it's it's not as visual. There's a lot of words, there's a lot of text um, on the screen here. So there's a lot of thinking in our head going on here about what do all these parts of the code mean? Um, think about your, your literacy um, and English um, learning and how we progress there. I mean, we don't just pick up novels and start reading um, straight away, do we? we? We have to be able to understand and recognise environmental print in the environment. And then, you know, we're, we're gaining awareness of phonics, um, breaking down words into syllables, you know, clapping out how many syllables are in our names. Um, we're, we're gaining understanding, understanding of rhyme. Um, so we can't just jump straight onto these abstract stages. It's got to start at the concrete stage. And even if you know we're only introducing computing science and computational thinking for the very first time, say primary four, primary five, or even further up the school, we still need to start at the very beginning at that concrete stage. Um, otherwise, you know, we, we won't properly, we won't fully understand it. Do we have any questions there, Louise? Um, we've just got a question asking what kind of uh, programming language is used. So I, I just replied saying that at the moment, you know, it's just, at, well, not at this moment, at early level and primary, it is more so focused on uh, block-based coding. And mm -hmm. you'll see it's just exactly, Eva, everything you've been saying mm -hmm. there about it being very visual and the, the colours as well. Great, thanks, Louise. So just um, a quick recap and a reminder from the approaches um, that we discussed at previous sessions and that we made reference to on the Barefoot um, Concepts and Approaches poster that we mentioned at the beginning. Now, whether you're using unplugged, concrete or pictorial resources, whatever it is you're doing, this is a really helpful slide to keep in mind because we want to keep making reference to the approaches. So what learning is taking place, you know, what exactly is going on here? So tinkering, or creating, or debugging, or persevering, and we're collaborating. So everything that we're doing, you know, you know, the, this is what's going on in the background, and it's just really important to remember that um, and to use these terms, especially the sort of terms like tinkering and debugging um, throughout the curriculum. Okay. 
you. And then just very quickly, just to remind us, how do we know that we're embedding computing science at the early level? Because we're self-evaluating, aren't we? We self-evaluate everything we do. We're asking ourselves, are we providing all these experiences and opportunities? Are we all encouraging children to recognise a range of technologies and their purposes? And hopefully from the three sessions, um, you'll see really clearly that the computing science experience and outcomes can be met and delivered in any or indeed all areas, all curriculum areas, so all practitioners can contribute and reinforce them. Okay, so I'm just going to move on now to a couple of handy resource slides um, just before we finish up. So very quickly. Um, I would just like to draw your attention to CERC, Scottish Schools Education Resource Centre, and our new digital officer that's based there, Kevin Reid. Um, all the links again are on the slides here, but um, CERC, are, uh, they're a non-profit company, they're, they're based in Dunfermline, and their purpose is to support schools in STEM, so science, technology, engineering, and maths learning. Um, Pop onto their website. There's lots of useful links there. There's um, primary bulletins packed and early years bulletins packed full of ideas and inspiration. And there's continually um, resources being added. They also deliver professional learning. And this big picture on the left here that I'm showing you um, is part of a funded course. And it's called Let's Play at Computer Science. And it's now open for applications. Everything's all linked here. That will take you straight to it. If you sign up to this course and you're lucky enough to, to um, gain a place on it, you will receive £300 worth of equipment. So you'll learn about it through two interactive sessions um, and then there'll be a little bit of self-study, um, a bit of practical hands-on um, professional learning as well. Um, it's going to consider the impact of unplugged activities and outdoor learning too. So just everything really that we've covered so far as well, but with the added um, bonus of getting your hands on some equipment for your settings too. Um, so if you have time, that's definitely one to, one to check out. And these were the resources I was talking about earlier on that I said, ah, I've never even saw that one before or that one's new to me so um good luck everybody if you do decide to apply for that um very quickly as well some videos that you can access to support either um, your own professional development or for use um, in learning and teaching through click view um, you might be aware that we can access some of the click view videos now through our um, glow accounts we need to look for the west os um, tile on Glow, so you can do a research. I just searched Click View um, just to show how easy it is to come up. And you can either access the West OS library. Um, I think that is that finishing, Louise, at the end of March, unless you're a local authority that's um, signed yes. up to it, I think it is. Yeah. But you'll be able to access the um, the, the public um, Click View library. So what's in there essentially is just a collection of videos from CBBS and BBC Bite Size um, all around computing science, and the the Click View the sorry sorry the West OS library for early level computing science has some lovely videos created by Miss Feeney, who is a practitioner um, in Glasgow City Council. I think um, part of the Connected Learning um, program, and she has some nice videos in there for um, explaining early level um, computing science and things that you can do with your learners um, as well. So all the links again are there. And then just very, very quickly, if you want to do some self-directed professional learning and you have access to um, Apple devices, there's a couple of different places that you can um, go there. You can take yourself through some self-directed um, guided coding learning on Swift playgrounds and there's some Apple teacher resources there, um, some books you can download that will take you through that step by step as well. Um, and then just to remind you that digilearn.scot is our national blog, it's an open blog, you don't need any sort of accounts to sign into this. You can access all our webinar recordings and all our upcoming webinars um, in there as well. Within GLOW, there's the National Early Learning and Childcare Professional Learning Community as well for 
all things related to early learning and childcare, all your key policy documents, examples of learning, um, sharing practice from other settings, everything um, in there. Um, just get past that one just now. And we mentioned the National Technologies Community earlier on. So again, this is within GLOW, but you can access um, all the resources that we'll be linked to earlier on here within the, the um, computing science tile. Okay, and then just very, very, very quickly, um, Knowledge Hub, um, if that's something that you've never came across yet, you can sign up, have a wee look, and you can sign up for updates and news for, um, you know, discussion in early learning and childcare. Um, and I think if 